Christian, Christian men rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Give you heed to what we say. News, news, Jesus Christ is born today. Hearts and hats before him bow, and he is in the manger now. Christ is born today. Christ is born today. Good Christian men rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Now ye hear the endless bliss. Joy, joy, Jesus Christ was born for this. He had opened heaven's door and an angel blessed forevermore. Christ was born for this. Christ was born for this. Good Christian men rejoice with heart and soul and voice. Now ye need not fear the great peace, peace. Jesus Christ is born to save. Calls you one and calls you all to gain his everlasting call. Christ was born to save. Christ was born to save. Take your Bible this morning for our scripture reading, if you would please, to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, if you would please. Three verses we're going to read this morning, verses 9, 10, and 11. We'll read 9 together, then I'll read 10, and we'll finish together reading verse number 11. Luke chapter 2. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the Scripture. All of us standing to read God's Word. And let's begin together on verse 9 of Luke chapter 2. Ready? And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for, behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And let's pray together. Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of our scripture here this morning. And Lord, we're asking you that you would prepare our hearts, that we'd be ready to receive the truth that you have for us today. Thank you for the wonderful music this morning. Thank you, Lord, for the good spirit that's in this place. And Lord, I pray you would help us now to focus and I pray that you'll bless the special as it's sung, that it'll tune our hearts to yours and it'll help us to turn our eyes upon you. And I pray that each of us would have ears to hear what you want to say to us this morning. It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. On the night Christ was born, just before break of morn, as the stars in the sky were fading, or the place where he lay fell a shadow cold and gray of a cross that would humble a king. Born to die upon Calvary, Jesus suffered my sin to forgive. Born to die upon Calvary, He was wounded that I might live. Jesus knew when He came, he would suffer in shame. He could feel every pain and sorrow. But he left paradise. With his blood he paid the price. My redemption to Jesus I owe. From the throne Jesus came, laid aside heaven's fame. In exchange for the cross of Calvary. For my gain suffered loss. For my sin he bore the cross. He was wounded and I was set free. Born to die upon Calvary. Jesus suffered my sin to forgive. Born to die upon Calvary. He was wounded that I might live. 
Dearest Lord, evermore, may thy cross I adore as I follow the path to Calvary. Of thy death I partake, my ambition I forsake, all my will I surrender to thee. Born to die upon Calvary, Jesus suffered my sin to forgive. Born to die upon Calvary, he was wounded that I might live. Now, Heavenly Father, we bow before you in prayer as we come to the preaching of your word. We want to thank you today for the Bible. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the account uh, here of the birth of the Savior coming into the world. Thank you for loving us and for caring for us and desiring that we would be with you one day, that you would send your only begotten Son, that he would willingly give his life on the cross, lay down his life for us as a payment for our sin. And Lord, we love you this morning. And I pray, Lord, that we would take the message that the angels delivered to the shepherds. And, Lord, we would understand that uh, this is tidings of great joy. Help me as I bring the message, and please help every individual as they listen. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Well, we sang it this morning, Joy to the world, the Lord is come. That's uh, many people's favorite uh, Christmas carol. It's interesting as you... Uh, if you ever really focused on the words of that song, you find that Isaac Watts was the one who wrote it, and, and he took it from one of the Psalms that is really not referring to the first coming of Jesus, but the second coming of Jesus. And, and it's kind of become a favorite of the Christmas season and talking about let every heart prepare him room. But the truth is that verse 2 says, Joy to the earth, the Savior reigns. And... Uh, verse 3 said, He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of His righteousness. And that, that isn't happening right now, but that's going to happen one day and uh, when He comes again. But I, I still think that the theme is the right theme. Uh, it's joy to the world, the Lord is come. And it's not He has come, but He is come. It's always in the present. It's always in, he's not the I was or I will be, he's the I am. So it's always in the present. And I think about the other song that the men sang this morning, I think, as good Christian men rejoice with heart and soul and voice. And again, good Christian men rejoice. Joy. You know, the Bible says a lot about joy. In fact, notice the message to the shepherds. Luke 2, if your Bible's still open there. The Bible says the... Uh, angels appeared, angel of the Lord appeared to them in verse number 9. And of course, they were afraid. And notice verse 10, The angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great, what church? Joy, which shall be to all people. Great tidings, tidings of great joy. You know, the Bible says a lot about joy. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. It says, if you sow in tears, you'll reap in joy. Jesus said, you shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. And that's, that's a little bit strange. He says, you're going to have sorrow, but your sorrow will turn into joy. Joy survives even in sadness and difficulty. And the reason that sometimes we don't equate joy with sorrow or joy with difficulty or joy with trials is because we kind of confuse, like many people do, joy with happiness. Joy and happiness are not the same thing. They're two, two different things. And happiness is a human emotion that is based on what happens to me. That's hap You can say happiness or happiness. It's way I, I, my, I'm happy if something good things happen to me or things that I perceive to be good. 
actually, it comes from some European words that literally mean luck or chance. Hap is an Old Norse and Old English root of happiness, and it means luck or chance. And so they believe, the Europeans believe that happiness was not something you could control. It was in the hands of the gods, small g. And especially one named fate or fortune. And that's why sometimes when we say, fortunately, this happened to me. Well, they, they got that from the god fortune. And then he smiled on me, so he let this happen. Okay? And uh, there's no fortunately for the believer. Okay? It's God that were rules in our life. But he, they believed it was controlled by the stars or by something that you and I could not really count on or make for ourselves. In other words, happiness is out of our hands. It's out of our control. It was in the hands of the small g gods or the stars or the planets lining up or something like that. That's why people still view happiness as something that's out there. That, that they're striving for, that they're trying to attain, that they're going to try to pursue it. And, and, and that we're, we're trying to always get it. And happiness, if that's the goal in my life, it's deceptive. I can't, I can't grasp it. Because what's going to happen is happiness is always dependent on what happens to me. And I cannot be in control of what happens to me. That's, uh, so I'm placing my happiness, it's based on what everybody else is going to do to me. You understand? And therefore, sometimes I'm happy, sometimes I'm blue. My disposition depends on you. No, it shouldn't. It shouldn't be that way at all. My disposition ought to depend on me, not on you. I'm not going to put that happiness in the hands of somebody else. And so we, we people think, well, if I just get more money, then I'm going to be, if I just got a better job, then I'm going to be, oh, if we had a different house. Oh, if I got a better car. And it's always something else we're looking for and reaching for. Thinking, then I'll have happiness. Then I'll, I'll, I'll enjoy life. But the truth is, biblical joy is completely different. And joy shows up in the most unusual places. Difficulties and trials and sorrows and, and because joy is not tied to what's happening in my life. That has nothing to do with joy. Joy is tied to Jesus Christ. That's who determines my joy and our joy as believers. I bring you good tidings of great joy. He's saying, listen, i got some good news for you, and it's going to bring great joy. Well, what was the good news? Hey, the good news was unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Oh, the joy is in Jesus. That's where the joy comes from. And as long as I have Jesus and I know that He lives in my heart, then I can have joy. Joy is a Bible word. Now, happiness is in the Bible as well. Can I tell you that happy, happiness or happy it shows, shows up in the Bible 25 times. Okay? But can I tell you, joy or rejoice or rejoicing shows up 373 times. Which do you think God is emphasizing to us? Happiness or joy? Huh. 373 to 25 is kind of like a, a rout. Okay? That's a wipeout. All right? And so we, we understand that joy is something that is found uh, and, and is, is rooted in knowing Jesus Christ. And when we have that joy, it's guaranteed. In Britain, they have something they call a National Happiness Index. I couldn't believe it when I read it, but they do. And a study was done from April 2012 till March 2015. And it suggested in their study that Christians are among the happiest people in that nation. And while those who do not identify with any particular religion scored the lowest in being satisfied with life. That's not surprising to me. You know, Paul, when he wrote the book of Philippians to those believers in Philippi, he wrote, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Where did he write that from? Prison. 
He was in, he was been arrested. He's writing the letter from prison and he's telling them to rejoice. Think, how can that guy rejoice? You know, we were, we were in the prison on Thursday night. And you know one of the hardest things to do? We stood before 33 men we had there on, on Thursday evening. You know what was hard to do? It was hard to look at those 33 men and say, Merry Christmas, guys. And it was hard because I know the circumstances they're in. How do you, how do you have a Merry Christmas in a, in, a, in a prison cell? How do you have a Merry Christmas when you're surrounded by the things they're surrounded with? And yet, you understand, some of those men were able to come and say, Merry Christmas. You know why? Not because of what's around them, but because of what's in them. What's inside of them. The joy is not from the outside. The joy is what's on the inside. That's the tidings of great joy. You see, that's why Paul said, hey, I, 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 know, I know how to be a, a base and I know how to abound. I know how to uh, abound. I know how to suffer need. I know how to be on top when I got everything and I know how to be down when I have nothing. I've been both places. He said, but I found that I'll be content no matter whatever state I'm in. I'll still be able to rejoice in the Lord always because it doesn't matter what's on the outside. It matters what's on the inside. And you can sit around at Christmas time and you can, you can look around you and you can think, see, if you're all by yourself, you'll look around you and see other people doing things and having family and having get-togethers. And you know what you'll do? You'll start to feel discouraged and down on yourself because you're looking at what's outside of you instead of what's looking on what's inside of you. Jesus is on the inside of you. Jesus is your Savior, and you can have joy. And that's really the secret of being content in life. Because Paul said, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. It's through Christ I have the ability to have joy and contentment. So I like what the angel said that day. I love the verse that says, Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. There ought to be something about Jesus Christ that brings joy to our life. There ought to be something about being around Jesus that, that gives you a joy and an inner, an inner happiness, if you will, that, that, that outside, it doesn't matter what's going on without you, you have joy within you. And there ought to be a difference in the life of a believer. You know, Billy Sunday used to say, you don't have to look like you fell out of the back end of a hearse to be a Christian. Okay? You're allowed to be joyful. And we should be joyful. It's an advertisement for Jesus Christ. And so, what is it about Jesus Christ that He's done for you and that He can do for you? You understand, there's nothing... Can I help you with something? There's nothing about a baby in a manger that's going to change your life. Okay? Babies are wonderful. They're exciting. They're nice. Uh, Brother Rob was telling me, I think he saw his grandbaby for the first time here yesterday, and that's great. And he says, it's okay, you know, he... He, he heard her cry, I think he said. And he says, I was okay to hear him cry for a little bit. <laughs> and then somebody get her. No. But uh, you, you know, nothing about babies are exciting, they're nice. That's not the issue. People, people don't have any problem coming around the cradle. But as they sang this morning, he was born to die. And the people that gather around the cradle sometimes are very reluctant to gather around the cross. But He was born in the cradle for Him to go to the cross and to die for our sins. And I'm so thankful that Jesus didn't stay a baby. He grew up to be a man. And as a man, He took on our sins and died on the cross for us. Jesus, even though we celebrate His birth, it's really not about Him being a baby. It's about Him being our Savior. And we can celebrate His birth, but it's nowhere in... Nowhere in the Bible does it ever command us to celebrate His birth. Do you know that? It's okay. We're not against it. We like Christmas and it's good to celebrate His birth. But what the early church celebrated was His cross. When Jesus says, I'll give you a memorial to remember me by, He didn't give them a manger. He gave the Lord's table. His blood and His body broken on the cross and His blood shed for us so we could have eternal life. It is about the cross. And so understand, that happened when He died on the cross. 
The story of that baby Jesus still can make me smile. But that little baby soon became a man. And the crowds that once cheered him on became a howling mob. Crucify him was their demand. They nailed him to a rugged cross, stained with dirt and mud. The only decoration on that tree was his precious blood. And there upon that Christ-filled tree we saw God's gift of love, the true gift from the Father up above. That's really the key to your joy. You know why it's good joy? You know why it's tidings of great joy? Because your sins can be forgiven. Oh, my friend, the songwriter wrote these words, If you're tired of the load of your sin, let Jesus come into your heart. If you desire a new life to begin, let Jesus come into your heart. See, Jesus takes your sin away. And when you don't have that load of sin anymore, there's great joy. And that's joy from the inside out, not from the outside in. It's joy from being in your sins forgiven by Jesus Christ. How can Christ dying on the cross bring joy? How can Christ dying on the cross bring contentment? Let me give you three thoughts this morning. Number one, Jesus' death can bring joy because I don't have to be afraid of dying anymore. I don't have to be afraid of dying anymore. You know, most people fear death. And we do just about anything to stave it off, to, to push it out as far as we can. We understand that. But Jesus died to conquer that. Look at the book of Hebrews. Would you turn there, please? Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Notice with me verse number 14. Hebrews 2 and verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, He also Himself likewise took part of the same, that through death He might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through, notice, fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Jesus didn't just die for our sins, but He was buried and He rose again the third day to show us that He conquered death. Okay? That's, that's part of the message that we believe when we become a Christian. When we, after we're saved and we get baptized, we say that, that we're buried in the likeness of His death and we are raised in the likeness of His resurrection. We're raised to walk in a newness of life, as the Bible says. That, that, that being buried in the water and rising back up is an indication that I'm going to be, I may be buried one day in a grave, but I'm going to rise again. Because He rose again. He's the first fruits, the Bible says, of all them that slept. You see, when for the Christian, if you've been born again, if you've had a second birth, if you've had your physical birth, and then you've had a spiritual birth of receiving Christ as your Savior, then my friend, you, you may die physically, but you don't die spiritually. The Bible says the moment you take your last breath here, your next breath in heaven. And there's no, the, the Bible says, death, where's your sting? Grave, where's your victory? There, there's none. Why? Because He's given us the victory. Jesus has conquered death. And so I know that I don't have to fear death. That's just going to be a transition from here to heaven. No more than I'd fear getting in my car and going from church to my house. I'm just transitioning from here to there. And death is just me transitioning from earth to heaven. And there's no fear in that. Because I'll be with the Lord Jesus. Not afraid of dying. It's amazing. The promise the Lord gives when He says that the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the trump of God, and with the, the, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain will be caught up to meet them in the air, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. One day Jesus is coming back. Just as sure as He came the first time, look at me, He's coming the second time. And we don't know when that time is. We may not get to celebrate Christmas. We may celebrate His birth with Him in heaven. It could be today. And, and He'll come. And it'll happen in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, the Bible says. So I'm not afraid of death. I'm not afraid of dying. Secondly, Jesus' death brought me joy because it showed me that Jesus cared for me. Jesus cared for me. 
He loved me enough to pay my sin debt. You know John 3.16. Say it with me, will you? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And, and by the way, I'm glad you know that and I hope you do know it. You know, there, there are literally millions of people in the world who don't know that. Recently, it was the anniversary of the first time Tim Tebow, who's a football player, he's not playing football now, but he, uh, you know, football players wear black stuff underneath their eyes, you know, and um, he put John 3.16 underneath his eyes on that black stuff with white, white lettering. I think it was 2012, I believe, was the first time he did that. And it was a couple days later when he received a phone call, his sports information director of Florida received the phone call. And, they, and, and he couldn't believe what he heard. They were reporting that during that game, when he wore that underneath his eyes, Google, you know what I mean by Google? Google reported 92 million searches on that question. What is John 3.16? 92 million people had to Google saying, what is that? They didn't know it was a Bible verse. They don't take for granted everybody knows John 3.16. They don't. We don't have that society anymore that grew up with the Bible. That grew up with the things of God. That's not the society we live in. So Jesus brought me death because I know He loves me. God so loved the world. It's personal. As we said in Sunday school, He said to the angels, the angels announced to the shepherds, unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. Not just to the world, though I'm glad He died for the world. I'm glad He came for everybody's sins. But listen, He was, he was born for me. He, he came and He died to take my sins so I could be saved. And He took your sins so you could be saved. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. I want you to look at a verse over in the book of Romans with me, will you please? Will you look at Romans chapter 8? Romans chapter 8, this is an amazing verse. Romans 8. Of course, you'll find there's a lot of amazing verses in the Bible. But this is one of them. Romans 8. Now, verse 31 is a great verse. You know what it says? Romans 8, 31. And what shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? <laughs> hey, hey, nobody. It doesn't matter who's against me as long as God's for me. But wait, verse 32. Are you ready? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? He's saying... If, if what is it that you need, what is it that you would desire of God that you're afraid that, to ask Him for, you're not sure He'd give it to you, when He says, I've given you My Son. <laughs> Man, if I give you My Son, what, uh, everything else is going to be below that. <laughs> everything else is going to fall underneath that. Uh, I, I'll, I'll freely give you all things because I've given you the best I have. I've given you My only begotten Son because He loves us. And He cares for us. Jesus' death on the cross for me means I'm not afraid of dying. And it also tells me that God cares for me. In fact, Jesus said, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You know, I heard, listen to, I heard Adrian Rogers this morning on the radio. He said something very, very profound I never thought about before. He said, Jesus Christ is the only one that ever chose to die. You say, no, wait a minute. What about those suicide bombers? He said, they didn't choose to die. They choose the time of their death. But nobody in this room has a choice to die. It's appointed unto man once to die. And after this, the judgment. There's the, we don't have any choice in the matter. We're going to die. If the Lord tarries... Everybody in this room is going to die. It's, it's what we're going to meet. The wages of sin is death. Sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. We're all, we're all at some, some part of that process of dying right now. Jesus wasn't. You understand? Jesus had no sin. He wouldn't have died. 
He chose to die for you and me. For you and me. Isn't that good? Wow. He cares for me. He loves me. Let me give you statement number three. Jesus' death gives me joy because it declares salvation is for all people. God so loved the world. Uh, Romans 8.32, did you notice? He delivered Him up for us all. What's all mean? All means all, that's all all means. Okay, He means all. And that runs counter to how most people think. In fact, much of what surrounds Christmas is about the secular world. In their eyes, it's kind of like the song, Santa Claus is coming to town. He's making a list, he's checking it twice, he's going to find out who's naughty and nice. The idea being, if you're naughty, what are you getting? Nothing, yeah. I'm, I'm getting nothing for Christmas, or I'm getting cold in my stocking. Oh, but if you're nice... You'll get gifts. You'll get good things. You see what people think? They, you know what they think? God's making a list. He's checking it twice. And I don't want to be on the naughty list. I want to be on the nice list. And if I'm on the nice list, God will be good to me. And if I'm on the naughty list, He'll be mean to me. And nothing could be further from the truth. You see, only, they think only the righteous, only the nice, only the good people are worthy of God's attention. They couldn't be more wrong. God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Oh, He didn't die for the good people, my friend. He died for the bad people. And the bad people is you and me. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us are guilty before Him. There's nothing worthy in me at all that I would have the attention of God or His Son. Nothing worthy in you at all that we would get the attention of God or His Son. He showed His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners. Jesus died for people who've messed up their lives. People died for people. Jesus died for people who have sinned in their life. Jesus died for people who everybody else has given up on. He came for all people. I bring you good tidings of great joy which shall be to all people. Everyone. Tidings of great joy. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. So I'm not afraid of death. I know God cares for me and about me. And salvation is for all people. Don't pass it up. Don't miss it. Don't, don't think it's just the baby in a manger and He's not the Savior of your soul. Don't miss it. Don't pass up the opportunity to know Him as your Savior. You'll be sorry if you do. I want to share an autobiographical account written by a man named Steve Hugo. It was about his childhood and his next door neighbor. Steve wrote this, As far back as I can remember, I always treated old man Jones, my neighbor, in the worst ways. Each April 1st, I had the burning paper bag with dog poop in it. Tradition. And even though old man Jones never fell for it, he still had a gross pile to remove from his front stairs. He always knew it was me, and he always said without anger in his voice, someday you'll be sorry. His driveway was right next to ours, and in the winter, I always shoveled our snow onto his drive, giving him twice the work. He never did get a snowblower. But when I was 12, just before a blizzard, one appeared in my driveway with a note saying, you might need this. I could now delight in blowing all the snow from my driveway and most of my front yard onto old man Jones's car. I would even cut a wider than needed path for my mom's car just to put more snow on the dinosaur's driveway. That's what my mom always called him, the dinosaur. He always knew that it was me, and he always said without anger in his voice, someday you'll be sorry. I keyed his car more than once. 
when I discovered the mint 1969 Mustang Mock Series car that always stayed under a thick canvas cover, kept for someone, I quickly sought to learn how many pumps of my BB rifle it took to send the metal orb through its windows. It took all ten pumps. He knew it was me and said without anger in his voice, someday you'll be sorry. Between my vandal's rifle and slingshot, most of his home's windows had to be replaced at one time or another, not to mention the battered aluminum siding that still bears the myriad of little dents. He never complained about the shattered bird feeder or the constant supply of dead squirrels, sparrows, cardinals, and whatever else winged its way into his yard. I do remember, though, the tenderness that he buried the vermin with, though. I can't recall how many times he had to take his cat to the vet to remove a pellet from an infected wound. But I remember that he always knew that it was me. And he always said without anger in his voice, someday you'll be sorry. At Christmas time, he used to set up lots of lights around his house. That looked like virtual BB magnets to me. And they were. A plastic manger scene was the target one year. He stayed on the relic's front lawn until I shot the baby's face off. He knew that it was me, and he said without anger in his voice, Someday you'll be sorry. There was this room in his house that I would look into sometimes when the old man was away. It was the kind of room that I would have loved to have had. If my mom could ever get a real job, it was just one of those, like one of those good housekeeping kids' bedrooms that everybody's supposed to want. I always figured that old man Jones was on the loony side. And this keeping a cool room for a kid he didn't have thing was final proof of his senility. I never shot that window out. My mom and I never had much in the money department. But every year on Christmas, a couple hundred dollars worth of cool stuff would be be left on my doorstep with Merry Christmas and my name written on each carefully wrapped gift. That's where the BB gun came from, along with a great target setup, which was never needed with the shooting range I had next door. My mom, too, my mom, too hung over each Christmas morning to get me up early enough to meet the gift bearer. She said the stuff came from my grandfather, whom she hadn't cared to talk or see since long before I came around. There had been some long-remembered fight over, this, over his interference in her life. So I never seen him and really didn't even know or care where he lived so long as the presents came. One Christmas, I got up early on my own because I thought that I might want to see what my ancestor looked like. Not to mention I was hoping for some BBs from my benefactor because old man Jones had just gotten a new bird feeder with, quote, unbreakable glass in it. And my gun was calling my name before the sun was up. I was still rubbing sleep from my eyes when I heard a soft shuffling on the porch. As I quietly opened the front door, the rising sun reflected off an armload of carefully wrapped presents in silver and gold paper, each one with Merry Christmas and my name written on it. The arms were still holding the gifts, but the face was hidden by a tall package. The obscured gift bearer was unaware that I'd even opened the door until he carefully put the gifts down. Startled, old man Jones stood up stiffly and with moistened eyes and broken voice said, Merry Christmas. Well, some day had come and old man Jones couldn't have been more right. Don't wait until it's too late to realize how much God loves you and how good He's been to you. Don't wait to realize that He gave His Son to die in your place. The Bible says it's the goodness of God that ought to bring us to repentance. If you believe He died for you, receive Him as your Savior today. Don't wait. Don't, don't spurn His goodness because someday you'll be sorry.
when you die without him and have to go to hell. Heavenly Father, take the truth this morning. Thank you, Lord, for sending your Son. Thank you, Lord, for providing a Savior for us from our sins. Thank you, Lord, that he came not to be born, but he came to live and he came to die. Thank you that he died on the cross as a payment for our sins. And we need not fear death anymore. We know how much you love us and you care for us. And Lord, I pray that none of us would spurn your gift. Would turn away from your goodness to us. That would look your gift of eternal life that was purchased with the blood of your own son and say, no, thank you. I don't want what you're offering me. Lord, may we see ourselves as that boy next door doing so many things against God, and yet you continue to love us and lavish gifts upon us and help us and protect us. And I pray, Lord, that we'd realize it before it's too late. We love you. I pray, Lord, that the joy we have in Christ would shine through this Christmas season. It would not be the happiness of what's, what's happening to us or what's happening outside of us, but the joy that comes from knowing Jesus and having Jesus on the inside of us. Speak to hearts this morning. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'll finish praying in just a moment. But I wonder how many folks in the room this morning would say, Pastor, I, I realized how good God's been to me. I realized that Jesus Christ died for me. He was born to die, and He died for my sins. And I haven't waited too late, Pastor. I, I, I'm not going to be sorry. I've trusted Jesus as my Savior. If I were to die today, Pastor, I know that I'd go to heaven because my faith is in Jesus as my Savior. If that's your case, would you put your hand up as a testimony and say, that's me, Pastor. I know that I'm saved this morning. Jesus is my Savior. You may put him down. You're here today and would say, Pastor, I don't know that for sure. I don't know for sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. I don't know that you talk about unto you is born this day a in the city of David, a Savior. I don't know that I ever personally have trusted Jesus or asked Him to be my Savior. But Pastor, I appreciate you praying for me. I will not embarrass you or call you out, but I'll certainly pray for you. Would you slip your hand up and put it back down and say, Pastor, pray for me this morning. God bless you. Thank you. Is there anybody else? Say, Pastor, pray for me today. Thank you. Thank you. Christian, joy or happiness? So, well, God just wants me to be happy. No, God wants you to be joyful. Joy is so different. I wonder if you'll say today, preacher, the Lord has spoken to my heart that I've got to stop this idea that I've got to be happy or I've got to pursue happiness. I just want the joy of Jesus to shine through me. I want to be a joyful Christian. I want to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Pastor, pray for me this morning. Would you slip your hand up, Christian? Joy is not dependent on your circumstances. Joy is dependent on Jesus. God bless you. Amen. You may put them down. In a moment, I'm going to pray. We're going to have our invitation. Listen carefully. If you slipped your hand up this morning, even if you didn't, and you're not absolutely certain that if you died, you'd go to heaven, you don't know that you ever had a time in your life when you put your faith in Jesus Christ. Then when I'm done praying, we'll stand to our feet. The pianist will begin to play. Bob's going to sing. As soon as you hear that piano hit the first note, slip out from your seat. Come right down here to the front. Meet me. We'll have someone who's been trained take a Bible and they'll show you how you can know you're on your way to heaven. All I can tell you is if you don't do it, you'll be sorry. Christian, if you need to come and bow the knee and say, Lord, 
let my joy show. Let me focus on what I have on the inside, not what I have on the outside. I don't want to be dependent on happiness, what's happening to me. I want to be dependent on what you're doing inside of me. Give me the joy, the tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Heavenly Father, have your will and way in this invitation now. Thank you for speaking to our hearts this morning. I pray, Lord, that your will will be done in each and every heart and life. Help those who need to come and say, you know, I'd like to know Christ as my Savior today. As soon as the music plays, I pray they'll step out. They'll walk out the doors in a few minutes, knowing they have eternal life and knowing the joy, having the joy in their heart of knowing Jesus. Have your way in the heart of believers during this invitation now. May your will be done, and I'll thank you for it.